suppose you, you, you had a remote control. You press this button, you know, 15,000 people would just cheer and you know, the place would vibrate from the energy. Every once in a while, you'd sort of try it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you wanted all that's left is the ghost of your smile stays a while and fades away I hear the footsteps on the ground tempting me to turn around it's not something we've consciously avoided but it's something we've never attempted to do and consequently you see if you want to walk through down the road here into this hotel with ten minders jogging or something like this with these guys around and call the press corps out so everyone's taking pictures for the next day and loads of guys with sunshades on all the time in the dark, <laughs> <laughs> then you'll get front pages. <laughs> The relationship with the audience is something just incredible. I've never experienced anything like it before. Uh, the direct contact they have with the fans, you know, through the website and uh, through people following the band, and there's, you know, the band always have time for the for the fans. I'm haunted, haunted. Is that what you wanted? Normally I take a record home, a deep level record. I play it once, my family goes, hmm, not bad. <laughs> and a couple of days later, you know, that's it. It doesn't get played again until we have a party or something. This record hasn't been stopped playing since I've been home with my family and friends. I come down and there's people doing the ironing and the hoovering and everything else listening to. Um, I imagine we'll be doing it tonight or something like that. And it's just, it's great. <laughs> He wasn't really ready to commit himself to the kind of workload that we really need to do, and he's got his his own musical interests, which he's, he's going on with. So it was a very amicable split. The big thing was the producer. Michael Bradford was, well, he came to hear the band, and he, he came out of left field. I mean, you talk about an unlikely, you know, if somebody was to say, you know, pitch the idea to, to somebody else, they'd say, well, how about this guy? Yeah, I like it. Yeah, he's done lots of bands like that. Well, Michael is, he's just a freak. He's, he's, he's a very, very smart musician, very intelligent guy, super ears. And he, he loves all kinds of music. And it was, it was fantastic for everybody just, just to see his quick thinking. And, and you know, he's a funny guy. And he, he wanted the band live and fresh on everything instead of just beating it into the ground. It was about three years ago we were on a tour of Australia and it was a Sunday we had a, a long flight I think from somewhere to Perth it was about a five hour flight and we're sitting there and I've got all the Sunday papers with all the supplements with me and Ian Gillen sitting next to me in the window seat doing the crossword and I'm reading the papers and I came across the travel section and there was a photograph there of it was a Vietnamese travel story and there was a photograph of a guy pushing a bike with great difficulty because on the front of the bike is an enormous mound of bananas. <laughs> and it's a lovely photograph, you know, I, just, I, I looked at it and I said to Ian, I said, look, there's an album cover, just use that photograph and call it Bananas. And he, he said, brilliant. I said, no, no, I was, I was joking. He said, no, but it's brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> and it's just, it hasn't died, you know, it's, it's one of those things that kept coming back. And I find myself now in a position of 
having gone through questioning it as to whether it's a good idea or not. It's certainly a bold idea. And the fact that it's got so many people talking about it, in a way, justifies its position. Because after all, it is only a word. It's huge, you know. R Richie's whole thing was, uh, you know, it was an image that, that a lot of people went for, especially at that time. And it's, it's, it's a huge part of the, the history of the band. And, uh, you know, I have no problems at all. People, people that like the band, they, they, they give me a chance. They come to the show and say, all right, show me what you got. <laughs> and as long as people give me a chance, I got no argument. Some said, asked Steve what it was like to step into Richie's shoes. Uh, the answer to which is, well, when Richie left, he took his shoes with him. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that. Initially, the, the approach came about 48 hours before, you know, the first concert. So there wasn't a lot of time to get uh, too nervous. But I remember my first reaction was going on stage, how exhilarating it was. And I couldn't really believe what I was hearing, you know, the energy of the band. It sounded like it always had. And it took me by surprise, I have to say. The relationship with the audience is something just incredible. I've never experienced anything like it before. Uh, the direct contact they have with the fans, you know, through the website and uh, through people following the band and there's, you know, the band always have time for the, for the fans. It's quite unusual in my, in my experience. Um, and just the band itself, you know, every, every night it goes on and gives the best show I possibly can. And I've worked with a lot of bands where that's not always the case, you know. In fact, I've worked with some bands where it's never the case. <laughs> <laughs> Playing Smoke in the Water, especially, has such a fantastic reaction from people. Um, that, coupled with the fact that it's always slightly different every night. I mean, even I can find different bass parts to play. Um, yeah, I meant to have a word with you about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll play it in G tonight, right? Um, it's um, it, even the old songs become new, you know. And I think you said once, it's been, "Smoke in the Water" is like a button on a wall. Oh and yeah. When you push it, great things happen. Suppose you you, you had a remote control. You press this button, you know, fifteen thousand people would just cheer, and the you know, place would vibrate from the energy. Every once in a while, you'd sort of try it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and once you try it, you sort of want to do it again just to see. Does that button still work? <laughs> <laughs> it used to be that, that, that people brought their children to see us. Um, now they're bringing their grandchildren to see us. <laughs> <laughs> Normally I take a record home, a Deep Purple record. I play it once, my family goes, hmm, not bad. <laughs> and a couple of days later, you know, that's it. It doesn't get played again until we have a party or something. This record hasn't been stopped playing since I've been home with my family and friends. I come down and there's people doing the ironing and the hoovering and everything else listening to. Um, I imagine we'll be doing it tonight or something like that. And it's just, it's great. When we were kids listening to our heroes, um, most of the stuff we listened to was rock and roll and blues. It was just three chords, which meant um, most people could handle it, even badly. It sounded okay. <clears throat> So that's why there's lots of people going around strumming guitars, some people with knitting needles and biscuit tins and things like that. But um, it was simple, it was easy, and that's never gone away. Only when rock music has tried to become pompous and overcomplicated has it kicked itself up the backside and everyone's going, mm, yeah, it, you're missing the point, you're missing the point, that's not what it's about. When you keep it uh, in a form where people can communicate just by listening, uh, that's the essence of popular music. You know, you've got to talk to people. You've got to affect them, touch them. It's no good just them watching and going, well, that's brilliant, but I don't understand the thing that's happened here. There's no point in that. Well, we've avoided television, mostly, um, basically for simple reasons. Um, <clears throat> we did the pop shows and that sort of thing in the 70s, but not very many of them, and we were quite reluctant. Um, and then we, we made a couple of, see, uh, a video, well, a couple of videos, 
and nobody played them, so we just thought, well, there's no point making videos anymore. That's ridiculous, waste of money. And I think we realised fairly early on that the reason we all came into music was to play music, not to be celebrities. Um, and I think that's really been the key to the longevity of it. Because if you're fashionable, by definition, tomorrow, you're not fashionable. Because fashion is something that changes all the time. And you might have to wait 50 years for something to come back into fashion, as far as that's concerned. But music never goes away. During those times when we were, for example, dinosaurs and wrinkly rockers and aging rockers and all that sort of thing, when we were getting pounded away, it didn't make the slightest bit of difference to us. It was just the press were working themselves into a frenzy because there was nothing of any quality around, so they started attacking something that was the only thing that they felt they could attack. It didn't make any difference whatsoever. The audiences were still there. there was, um, we were still progressing. It was painful because we'd never been personally attacked so much, but all the musicians of our generation just thought, oh, well, you know, I won't buy this newspaper anymore. I, just, I, don't, <laughs> I don't need it. Yeah. And uh, so it, made, it gave us a new phase of confidence, I think, in ourselves. And um, it, was a, it was a tough time to go through. But there again, the early days were tough times as well, learning the business, learning the trade, learning how to get through a tour with your sanity and your wallet intact, you know. It's not something we've consciously avoided, but it's something we've never attempted to do. And consequently, you see, if you want to walk through down the road here into this hotel with ten minders jogging or something like this with these guys around and call the press corps out so everyone's taking pictures for the next day and loads of guys with sunshades on all the time in the dark, <laughs> uh, then you'll get front pages. You know, we were musicians when we got married when we started our family. The only people who didn't know we were musicians were the children who were about to be born. And I remember a conversation with my daughter when she was 12. And she said, Daddy, you're going away for a whole month. That's you know, a long time. And when you're young, a month is a long time. And um, so I explained to her that, in effect, I get about six months of the year off. It may look as if we're touring all the time, but when I come home, for example, this year, after making the record, um, we finished in beginning of February? Yeah, I've had three months off. I've had three, four months off. Three, a quarter, a third of the year at home. And the same then. I said, you know, your friends at school, their dads come home at five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock. They're tired. They have an hour, maybe read your story or something like that. And on the weekend, they go to the football or shopping with your mother or... You know, maybe they get a chance to play on Sunday, but they also have to rest. It's not a lot of time. Yeah. And I'm home for three months, and I see you every day. The all moment day. you come home, all, all day, all day. The during day. the summer holidays, the whole time we go play, we go do things together. It's really quality. It's just different, that's all. We're all very much the same with good, strong families. And, um, you know, when things aren't going well, your wife is your manager as well. and you know, somebody to talk things through with, who's not in the band, who you can just bounce ideas off and pour your heart out and say, oh, you know, what a science of ideas, you know, whatever. And then they go, yeah, all right, now get back in and do it. <laughs> Very few people our age yeah. can still be 16-year-old kids for two hours a night whenever we feel like it. Mm. It's great. You know, you, you, you can throw away the reality of your, of your physical years because when you're on that stage, that's, that's nothing to do with anything you're, you're creating. It's in here. You're still the 16-year-old who's been on stage for the first time and having a great ball just, hey, look, this is wonderful, isn't it? This is really great fun. I mean, I can't think of a better job. No, me neither. I saw John two days ago. He's very happy. He's, uh, he's still writing lots of music, mostly orchestral. Um, basically... John didn't get tired of, of making music, he got tired of being on the road. He got tired of hotels and aeroplanes and losing 20 hours, 22 hours a day and not being able to create anything. Uh, he wanted more time to do his writing and the only way he felt he could do it was to be in one place for longer. Uh, I say he didn't enjoy the touring aspect of, of uh, Purple anymore. And he made a very brave decision to say, OK, my heart says I need to do this, so I will do it. But uh, he's very happy. Uh, we're still obviously the best of friends. And he'll probably show up and laugh at us somewhere in England when, when we do the tour there next week.
We've faced negative questions like that since time began. After three years, people have been saying, well, you've changed. Is it right that you should be carrying on? This isn't the original Deep Purple. Roger and I joined. There were two changes in the band already. Mm. The band has a spirit, and it has a, a life of its own. It's bigger than any of the individuals in the band. Uh, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a euphemism or an analogy that's made about many other things in life, and I see no reason why it shouldn't apply to. The only time when a member changes is when you've got a solo career, then it's tricky. But as far as a band is concerned, I think as long as you have the identity of the band, it's, it's a good thing. Now, I don't believe that there's any doubt of um, the continued enthusiasm of the audience. We're working to an incredible crowd. We're looking around the other day at 10,000 kids, the average age, 18 years old. And they were singing every single word, the, the old songs, and picking up the new stuff before we'd even sung it. They know, the, they know the words better than he does. Yeah, always. <laughs> But I think um, it's a procreative process, and uh, I think it, it would be, um, you know, it's, it's not the way we look at it. These questions are asked. People ask us the question, but we never ask that question ourselves. I think it was a great time because live music was still the norm. Today it's all taped and discos and DJs. You know, I, it drives me nuts when DJs are stars. They're guys who just spin records. Bar version and then one with the uh, straight tail. This is the straight 
Yeah, yeah, for some of the purple stuff. Why were you stuck at the beginning? Things like that? Yeah. I'm getting really worse by I didn't know. I know that they make custom made guitars and personalized guitars, but I didn't know there was a Steve Morse guitar. It, the hardtail one, like the straight one that I played the most, that one's actually, it's. For some reason, I, I have no idea why. Since I pick every note, even when I'm playing with tons of distortion. You know? mm -hmm. I did the first 50 by hand, yeah. and uh, it's, it's been through a lot. We've made some changes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is your main stage guitar? Yeah, it's number one. I think with me everywhere. Great yeah. character. Yeah. How are you? Let's see a lot of scars. Yeah, that sounds good. Really? <laughs> but what you'll hear is you'll hear the guitar is making the impact and then the note comes in. So, and your ears don't miss the attack as long as the guitar is good. If the synth was up too loud, then, then you would see what sound funny. It would sound like it's behind the pad. So that's what we do. There are always pages to we definitely would have had a fun go out. Look at this Oh, yeah. So, I think we're on the road. These are problems. I reckon we get some fun in the early. Um, but we still we should only finish at 5 2 10. So, that, that, yeah. I mean, I can write out of it. So, I think if we might be on track, you know. And this is, 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 and what you should be carrying out for myself. It's what you actually enjoy playing, what you should be doing. Okay. Okay. And all these are after shows. Yeah. 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 Yeah.